support. Let's go. All right, here they come. Welcome everybody. Hello, hello. We're gonna give everyone a minute to find their seats and then we'll get started. Okay. Well, we still have some people joining us, but we're going to go ahead and jump right in because we have a lot to do and very little time to do it in. And uh, and Head Start, we like to be respectful of one another's time. So my name is Rachel Hutchison. I am the uh, manager of online instructional design here at NHSA. And part of that is making sure that we have really excellent resources for our instructional staff. And today we're going to talk about tackling challenging behaviors in some rather unusual ways. So without further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and just give you a couple of housekeeping notes. First off, everybody's on mute. Um, that's just to keep things running smooth while we're here. You're welcome to put any questions you have in the chat. We're going to answer them as best we can throughout this 30 minute chat. Um, there's also going to be a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to drop those in. Um, this is being recorded. And the recording and all of our resources will be available to you in a follow up email after we're done today. So if you miss something, have to step away or want to share this with a friend, go back, watch it later. That will be an option available to you. Okay, so today we're going to talk about challenging behaviors. We're going to talk about them in the context of love, uh -uh, yeah. tackling challenging behaviors with love. Just not the, the way that we normally would think about facing a challenging behavior, but let's think about why that's important. And our speakers today to bring that to you are the over fabulous Dr. B. You may remember her from her days at the Office of Head Start. She is also our uh, Deputy Director of Innovation and Community Engagement here at NHSA. And we also have with us Ron Schwally, who is going to talk to you about behavior mastery. Uh, and again, from some very unique perspectives. So excited to look at what love looks like when you're facing challenging behaviors and why that's important. So take it away, Dr. B. Yeah, it's great to be here. I am um, super excited to jump into this topic. We've been doing these uh, tackling challenging behaviors um, webinars to talk about classroom management from a different perspective. We have a um, classroom management credential here at NHSA that combines kind of these different ways of looking at classroom management than sort of the traditional um, uh, mechanisms that you might have in place. It doesn't replace those things. It's more of a layer on top to just bring you some joy in the process. That's a really important part to me. The class that I teach specifically is called Trust First. And here's the basic premise of trust first, and it can exist in an early childhood classroom. It can exist in a high school classroom, and it can also be something that you just embrace as a leader with adults. It, it's not limited to children. The idea is simply that human beings um, thrive in places where they feel trusted and where they can trust other people. So building trust in classrooms looks very specific. I teach 10 very specific skills that will build a trust first classroom. And when we talk about um, love, which is the topic for this particular half hour, um, what I'd like to, to touch on are a couple of things. I'm gonna kind of um, step into it a little bit here and then get more specific later in the webinar. But the idea is pretty simple. And that is that love is unconditional. That should be something that comes into the classroom without condition. So what you're basically doing as a uh, professional, whether you're working as a lead teacher, an instructional assistant, or anything in the realm of engagement with children, you're doing that from a place of unconditional love. And when you can think of children in that um, aspect, a lot of the things that the day-to-day -day sort of um, behaviors that weigh us down all of a sudden get much lighter. 
because what we tend to do with behaviors is personalize them. We, we turn them into things that somehow are reflection on ourselves. And once that happens, we sort of get paralyzed in terms of our ability to really cope and move to the next, to the next space of the day. So if you walk into a classroom with this idea that your love for children is unconditional, you can do so much more with mm -hmm. every moment of that day. And so I'm going to kind of like say, that's going to be the premise where I start. I'm going to give you some actual skills you can use later. And there's a mantra that I, I pull from that on its surface sounds a little jarring, but then if you think about it, it really is a great thing to stick in your back pocket. And that is care less, love more. Think about that for a minute, noodle that around in your brain, care a little less and love a little more and see what that just does to your insides. And I'm going to turn it over to Ron and let him talk about this for a minute. And we'll come back and, and I'll, I'll give you some skills in a little bit. I, I love that. First of all, I appreciate uh, being on and uh, just being able to share the love that I have for helping teachers and working with early childhood uh, people, anyone. Um, for me, love starts with myself and love starts with the early childhood educator. Before you even walk into a classroom, before you walk into a center, before you go into your home child care, uh, if you're not feeling love for yourself, that's going to be a challenge. So one thing I'd love to do is even just start this off with some love. I'd love everybody just to put their hands out like this. Ooh, my, my color's changing. And then just give yourself a hug and just take a breath in. And as you breathe out, say to yourself, I love you, me. I love you, me. You can say it out loud. And then one more time, take another breath in and say, I love you, me. And that's how you start. If you don't have love for yourself, then it's going to be challenging to give that love to others. And I know that from experience. So I look at creating a world of win-win where even communicating with a child can come from one of two places. It can come from love, which is win-win, or it can come from being right, which is win-lose. And sometimes we don't even realize that we don't come from love because love essentially is what we're taught, you know, the heart. And a lot of us come with our brain into the classroom and our brain says words to us like uh, I've heard people have said, you know, that child's not making eye contact with me. A lot of us have been trained, look at me when I talk to you. And if you look at that child and go, they're not looking at me when they're talking to me and they're not, then that's not coming from love. It's coming from your program brain, which is about being right. So if you can access your heart which actually has its own intelligence system and it sends more messages to the brain than the brain does to the heart. If you can actually connect to your heart and then have a conversation with the child, you'll notice how much less you're being right and making that child wrong and more of just, I got you. I understand. Sure, the sky's purple and the grass is brown and, and dogs have 10 ears and whatever you say, what center do you want to go to? You know, just be open to love. It's beautiful. That is um, a really great philosophy, Ron. And I think that we can all enjoy taking a moment to respect and care for ourselves and understand mm -hmm. how that's a great level set. Can you move into like, what are some practical ways? What does that look like in the classroom in the midst of a challenging behavior? Do you stop and like, okay, me, we got this me. What does it look like? Give us some methods. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes if a child is having and what I call an emotional experience. Some people call it a fit. Some people call it a breakdown. I like to even have my words consist of love. So if a child is having an emotional experience and we feel triggered to stop that child from having their experience, instead of letting them be, 
Sometimes that's because our inner child is getting triggered and doesn't want to feel the emotions that we're supposed to feel because we're emotional creatures and emotions are energy in motion. So that child is doing what their body is telling them to do by expressing this emotion, whether it's rage, anger, sadness, upset, happiness, joy, and getting this emotion out. The first thing that you can do is just be present and take a breath or two before you're even going to step in to a situation with a child. If a child's having an emotional experience, I, most of the time in my classes, don't even handle it. And I have kids designated as breathing buddies to go over to the child, place their hand gently on their shoulder. And all the child says is, I'm going to breathe with you. And then that child is going... While the other child's going, eh, 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 eh. but then the other child is going, and three or four breaths and energy flowing back and forth. All of a sudden, there's this win win, there's this love. Nobody's telling the child, no one's towering over, calm down, relax, take a breath. There's a tour coming, the state's coming in, blah, blah, blah. All you're doing is you're just letting this child be themselves. And that's love. It, it's, it's something called holding space, letting someone have an emotional experience without interfering and doing the, it's going to be okay, it's going to be fine. Yeah. All that stuff is accidentally and knowingly, in my opinion, choosing win-lose because you're making it about yourself instead of experiencing, well, what is this child going through? What would I do if I had this experience happening? And maybe modeling some self-regulation skills and then creates win-win and then the child chooses to finish their emotional experience instead of doing it because of whatever situation the adult is, 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 has going on. Dr. B, I know you want to jump in here. I do. I, I want to say so many things, not the least of which is I love the fact that we have some of these folks introducing themselves in gr small groups or pairs that you're watching together. What a great thing to be online together with peers and you folks in the car drive carefully while you're listening to us. Um, but just love that you're working together on this stuff because I think it has far more um, stick to if groups of adults are on the same page and kids can feel that consistency. If they feel that it's different when I'm in Miss Mary's class than when I'm in Dr. B's class, then it's going to be confusing to them. So the more you can get on the same page as an organization, I think it's really great. Um, but what I really love about the way we do classroom management or tackling challenge behaviors or whatever we want to call it, and I, I just like to think it, of it as learning how to love your job, because it's really hard to love your job when it feels like... Um, like like you don't have control over it. And I think that is where teachers fall into a little bit of a trap of feeling, I can't control all of these little people. And so I must be doing something wrong. And so I get lower and lower and lower about my work. And we wanna bring joy into that space. What I love about the way we do it here is that it is this combination of really unique approaches to humanity and less about a prescriptive checklist of things that you're going to do and magically everything is going to be sunshine and roses in all classrooms, which I think a lot of classroom management programs are packaged in a way that it's all about fidelity to the program. That if I just do all of these things and I, and I have my handy list and someone comes in and verifies that I'm correct, then all of a sudden everything will be just magical. And first of all, who can manage that? I always felt for teachers who had some kind of a fidelity list around classroom management. To me, those were like completely conflicting. And second of all, they're humans. It isn't gonna work that way. So what we're talking about here, Ron and I teach two completely different classes, but they are so beautifully intertwined. He's talking mm. about the physical opportunity we have to breathe through an emotional experience and get to a place yeah. where life doesn't feel so heavy. And someone put in the chat, what age group, any age group, really any age group, not infants, us. but, but us three-year-olds, 
four-year-olds, five-year-olds, they can all do these things. In fact, they're probably better at it than we are because they're just going to do what we ask them to do. And then they're going to realize that connection, that buddy helping someone breathe, three-year-olds can do that a hundred percent and feel really good about themselves. Um, so I just love that. That's one skill everyone can take from this this webinar, take it back, try it out. Let us know. How did that work with you? If you teach your kiddos to be breathing buddies with each other, you first have to teach them how to breathe, of course, and they need to know how to do that properly. Um, we do that in trust first. I know you do that in yoga Roddy and, um, and then they help each other with it. What a, what a beautiful way to, to manage, um, a, a, an emotional moment in a classroom. For trust first, one of the thing, one of the skills that we teach is, is it, and a lot of what we teach is around language. So, so much of what Ron was talking about, use the words that I don't even really love challenging behaviors. I'm going to be honest with all of you. I feel like it's got such a negative charge, but you know why we use it, it, it at the Academy at NHSA? Because we know Head Start people relate to that phrase and they, they know what it means. We haven't found yeah. yet a, a phrase we can use where folks will know what we're talking about. So we use it, but, but I really think what we're talking about isn't so much about tackling anything. And I'm not really sure behaviors are necessarily challenging behaviors. It's just about existing as human beings in a space all day long and figuring out how to do that and not being the control her, the, the controller of the show that when I say this, you're going to do it. And so everything's going to work beautifully. It's more about how do we work together in our own spaces? And those are going to be different for everybody at every moment. So it's a lot. So you've got your breathing buddy um, strategy that Ron shared with you. What we teach in Trust First is something, it, it's around language and it's teaching children to literally understand that they can ask for what they need or what they want. Most of the time, what we call challenging behaviors are stemming from not getting something you need or want. And that is even true in adults. We get frustrated when life doesn't go our way. When we don't get what we need or we want, it gets harder to manage. Now, as you get older, you get more mature, you have a little bit more self-control, you understand perspective better. So at three, four or five years old, that's really tough. But if we can help children to ask for what they need or what they want and feel empowered to do that, many of those situations don't ever occur because we've empowered children to take care of themselves. So we literally teach in Trust First to use the phrase, I want or I need, and to deliberately take the time to teach children how to use that phrase, how to ask, and then what our response is going to be. Um, everything we want or need isn't always immediately accessible. That is true. But if we understand what children want or need at any one time, we're going to have an easier time either fulfilling that need or figuring out how to, um, how to address the need at the moment. And that is much easier than, you know, stop crying or getting frustrated because a children a child refuses to come to carpet time or something like that. So so that is the back pocket skill that I'm going to share with you in today's short webinar around um kind of shifting from control to love. The unconditional love means you can tell me what you need or what you want and as someone who loves you I'm going to support you and and see if I can I can help to get you there. Can I add I something on top of to that? Jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to jump in. Yeah. So now here's the thing for everybody watching. How many of you like to help other people? Raise your hand. Okay. Now keep your hand up if you like to ask for help and tell people what you want and need just as much. So you see, the hands are going down. So the thing is, if you're a person that's been programmed that being selfish and self care is wrong, if you're a people pleaser, then you may find it a challenge for yourself to tell people, I want, I need. And you're a person that's just waiting for somebody to do what you want them to do and help you, but you've never asked. And your brain goes, well, they should know. If you're having a challenge with self-love in the area of asking what you want and what you need, it might go against everything in your brain for a child to do that. 
See, I need attention all the time, which is why I need to be seen. That's why I'm a pro wrestler. That's why I, I've been in front of stages and thousands of people. I need to be seen. I need to be heard. There's some kids that need to be seen and need to be heard. But if you're a person that isn't like that, that's where the challenge comes in. So opening your heart and understanding that the kids are going to be different than you and then you can have them ask for what they want. It's beautiful. I just posted a video. So I should talk about this. Yesterday, we had a video where I was in my class and I was teaching kids to ask for attention because we don't communicate to kids, kids clearly. This is how you ask for attention. So they, if they want attention, have to figure it out themselves. And usually it's not like, um, hello, Miss Teacher. Oh, I would like attention right now. So I actually teach my kids who wants attention and the kids do this and that, who else? And you watch them. And then afterwards it's done 30 seconds, 45 seconds, endorphins kick in, they get what they want. And then my invitation to you is ask for attention from somebody in your life that you don't get attention from and, and see how that goes. And when, you and do I would it, say, Ron, what, what you're yeah. talking about too, we encourage at, I'm sure you do this at trust first, you should model these things for your kids. So it's also yeah. okay as a teacher to stop and say, I want, or I need, and, and yes. you could, you could role play that with an IA or with a child. And then, they become that becomes part of the culture in the classroom. And I want to link that to a question from Alicia, who is asking, what if a child is hurting themselves in an emotional experience? Really good question. And here's what I find when I do these webinars and folks start throwing out very specific examples. I can address them. Um, and, and I will address this, but I will also say that it is this is all about creating classroom culture that is a bigger undertaking than just one moment. So it's about walking into a, a classroom, and in my my hope, it's a whole program, where we're deciding we are going to create a trust-first environment. And when we do that, we are setting the stage so that things like self-harm are less likely to be what a child goes to when they are frustrated or or not getting their needs met. Because the self-harm, the hurt, if I am three or four years old and I am finding the need to bang my head on a floor, there is a bigger thing going on there than, than that moment. And a lot of times it's, it's classroom structures that, that where, where children don't have the language to ask for what they want or what they need, or even feel empowered to do it, as we was talking about, that will um, kind of create that, that moment where that's the best I can do is to show you through this behavior that is very disturbing to a to an adult who cares about a child. So I totally understand that. But mm. jumping just to that scenario, I would in no way say that you're going to leave a child in an emotional experience that has the potential to hurt him, her, or any other child in the classroom. Those are things that um, we have to have mechanisms in place to handle at the moment because the the experience is such that, that you can't see that through. But if we're creating classrooms that are inherently trust-centered, the likelihood of those things occurring drastically reduces. It doesn't mean never, but it is very unusual in a trust-centered environment that a child has to do that because they've got other ways of expressing their frustration or telling you what they need or filling their own needs or getting a support from a buddy. And they learn those things. So now all of a sudden that need to bang my head on the floor doesn't even occur to me because I've got other ways of filling my bucket. So that's sort of- yeah, I and, there, and, there's a, Alicia. and there's a lot of ways to do, even if some kids need to physically release energy, there's other ways to do that when I worked at, when I lived in New Jersey, I worked with this uh, Deve Douglas Developmental Disability Center at Rutgers. It was autistic uh, children and training uh, people how to work with them. 
And there were kids that would do that banging their head against the ground and they would have to slide a mat underneath because the communication wasn't there and wait till they're done. We introduced dynamic tension, which is just squeezing your muscles and squeezing your fists and squeezing your legs and pushing your feet into the ground as hard as possible. So all the major muscle groups are just squeezing and breathing and squeezing and breathing and breathing. And then 10, 15, 20 seconds of that, and you're physically exhausted and that energy is burnt off. Uh, we do fire breathing, which is another one, especially for areas where you can't run the kids around outside, where all you're doing is you're breathing in and out with your nose. And it's just... And you do that for 30 seconds and it's amazing how much energy it burns off and it over oxygenates the brain. So you get so much oxygen going on, your body just goes into this Zen state and breath work is magical too, especially if you model it and do it with the kids. I, I can't say enough about what Ron is talking about right now. I think we have completely undervalued how breathing, it sounds so simple, and mm -hmm. can and that I think we ignore the value of it. And if we can get teachers to really utilize, and that means you've got to teach kids how to do it and then give them space. And we have to do it ourselves and give them yes. space to do it and have a real respect for the physiological piece. This is not about the Zen moment of peace and meditation. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the physiological impact of increasing oxygen to the brain. And that is the very right. first thing we teach in Trust First. And the best thing to do with kids is to show them the brain, show them what it looks like and what it looks like when you feed it more oxygen and let them understand the science behind it and they will get it. And they will understand how stopping and breathing changes them. And I'm saying this, and I know some of you are out there saying to yourselves or to each other, we do this, we do this because we're seeing more of it in classrooms, but I, I really think it's one of the lowest pieces of hanging fruit that we can pull from that we just don't use. And I'm not well, sure why. Before we move away from breathing, there was a couple questions in the chat and I wanna make sure that we get to them before we run out of time here. But one was, is there an alternative to the breathing buddy that a home visitor could use? I think that's a great question. Is there nobody else there? It's just one child? Let's assume that answer is yes. Or if um, there's always someone else there. Clarification in the chat. Yeah, three year olds don't live by themselves. You could you could have a <laughs> a, a sibling, or you could have a parent, or anybody could do that, right? So a breathing buddy is just someone who's going to help you get that come to center kind of moment. It's probably easier with a peer. So I would think, Ron, you tell me, I think that's yeah. easier with a peer. So if you've got a sibling. I, I, I take myself, when it comes to emotional experiences, because I don't know what the source was, I remove myself from it and let the kid do it because like the kids in the classroom already know that kid. So if it's a new teacher and they're like, oh, calm down, blah, blah, blah. All the other kids are like, that's Joey. And they just walk around and while Joey's, and they're like, okay. And then Joey's done after 30 seconds and that's it. So, I mean, you can, you know, breathe. I love the also what you talked about, the modeling it, where it's not like try this, try that, but it's like, I feel frustrated right now. I really am upset. Hold on a second. Fire breathing. Cold breathing. Take your tongue, put it behind the back of your bottom teeth. Wow, I feel better. And then you go on and the kids are just like, what just happened? And then they absorb <laughs> it because it's also passive learning as opposed to when you tell someone to learn something, your brain just shuts off from learning, which is such so an interesting brain thing. If you don't have an audience of peers, if you're an, a home visitor and you're working with one child in a family, then that modeling could be a great alternative for that breathing buddy. Yes, um, There was absolutely. one additional question um, in the, about the attention where you were giving everyone an opportunity to ask for attention what does that look like as part of a preschool day? Do you like work that into circle time? What does it mean? For for me, it's just when I notice that there's a lull or when I notice that one of my kings and queens is taking over the classroom because they're doing something more interesting and fun than I'm doing, then what I do is I will just pattern interrupt, which is part of behavior mastery, where I'll just like woof or something like that. And then I'll try to re-engage the child and just have them 
Um, just try different types of breathing. Um, really, really focusing on just getting them away from what happened five seconds ago. Like a pattern interrupt, whether it's a whether it's a song, whether it's something, will immediately snap a child out of whatever was going on because it puts them on a different like state change. Tony Robbins calls it a state change when you change your thought pattern from one to the other. And so Rachel, were, I would I, yeah. I would just go back to, to Kayla. I mean, I think this is the kind of question everyone's thinking of, right? Is what if the child is destroying a classroom or hurting others? I, and I know this is going to sound like I'm evading the question. I'm really not. But there, this is a comprehensive solution to the way classrooms run traditionally, which is I'm taller and older, so I can tell you what I need you to do and you're going to do it to I'm going to create a trust first centered classroom where children feel empowered to take care of themselves, to express themselves, to fill their needs. And, and, and they feel that unconditional love that we're talking about. So that destroying the classroom piece is far more rare. And so when you ask that question, it becomes the one, two times a year that you do, I mean, there, you are going to have some kids that have a moment and they don't know how else to do it. And you're going to have some kids with special needs whose go-to is to throw a chair or something like that. And you're going to, but that will become the rare example that you figure out and not the norm that you're trying to handle day to day, which is where I think a lot of classrooms are sitting. And that's our goal. Now that's hard because that's not what you want to hear. You want me to give you an answer to that so that we can fix it like this. Yeah. And and the reality is that that I would be remiss to do that because it, this is about creating a holistic culture that get, empowers kids, that puts trust at the center. And when you do that, all, all of those things will generally take care of themselves. And then when you have that one moment where a child really does have a temper tantrum and there is risk of folks getting hurt. Maybe you take all of the other kids outside to play for a while while somebody handles that particular situation, but you can't do that all day long. So it can't be the norm. It's gotta be the exception. You wanna build a, a, a culture to where that becomes the exception and not the norm. And I know we're out of time. And, and, yeah. and, and also my, my ADHD just took me off. I don't even think I actually answered the question regarding um, the the when to ask for attention um it's all day i mean whatever in my opinion if a child needs 30 seconds to ask for attention every hour usually you're spending more than 30 seconds every hour trying to figure out ways how to handle the child deal with it or a uh, dr b you mentioned that insane concept called control that we're actually taught that we can control anything we can't even control the thoughts that come into our head that make us judge kids. So for me, it's just, if you have a child that you know is gonna be Adam Sandler, is gonna be John Cena, is gonna be the next whatever, and that kid needs attention every 30 seconds, 45 seconds, an hour, my question to you is why not give them attention other than, because I mean, if that child's the customer, so give them what they need, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And some kids need attention more than others, uh, my my question is, why not give them as much attention as possible? Fantastic way to end our half hour together. We are just like starting to skirt over time. But obviously, this isn't something we can give you answers to in half an hour. It's all about a process. And it starts with you. So what we want to do today is um, share with you our classroom management credential, which is made up of three classes where we really dive deep into exactly this, the philosophy behind Trust First, and how do you implement that in your classroom in different points of the day. You'll learn about how to make transitions fun and meaningful, and you will learn about how to control out of control times like music and movement. And we're going to add in Ron's new behavior mastery class for free. So if you sign up for our classroom management credential this spring, we actually have a promotion code so you can get it at less than half what it normally costs. We think this is that important. We want you in those classes. So we really hope to see you this spring. We start up in February. If you have any questions at all, please do feel free to reach out to me. I'm sure Dr. B and uh, Ron would also be very happy to answer follow-up questions. And we really hope to see you in class with us this spring. And we're all gonna learn how to go forward with trust and tackle challenging behaviors with love. 
Um, we also hope that you will be back with us next month. We've got more fun, engaging ways to tackle those challenging behaviors ahead. And the, the uh, rest of the webinars are recorded and on our website. Check them out anytime. All right. Have an amazing day, Head Start. We appreciate you. Bye. Bye, everyone.